Hi YouTube and happy Sunday. Since my last video I've made a lot more exciting progress on upgrading and installing Linux to my Samsung Q1 Ultra Ultra Mobile PC or UMPC which we see here before us. As you remember from my past video I showed you how you can upgrade the RAM and hard drive in your Q1 Ultra. It was a little bit of working the case apart but eventually I was able to do that and install both a M SATA SSD and a ZIF M SATA adapter. That's a 128 gig SSD that I put in, and I upgraded the DDR2 RAM from one gigabyte to two gigabytes. What I'm going to show you in this video is both how those upgrades are successfully reflected in the BIOS and Anti-X Linux, which I did manage to install on this device. I'm very excited about that. I was just thinking back, and I used to be excited about um, embedded Linux distributions, Linux on Android devices, routers, and other devices like that. But I think a small computer that uses an ARM or x86 processor with a Linux distribution support over a long time is a lot better than just piecemeal distros for, say, you know, a Zipid Z2 or other devices like that. Anyway, so with those thoughts shared, I'm going to go ahead and turn on the device. And there's a little slide switch here, and I'll make sure I can catch the BIOS right when this starts up. There we go. I, I'm glad I got that. Sometimes it takes a few tries. Okay, so this is the BIOS, which we're... we're um, which I've, I've opened up and got it into here. Hopefully you can see that clearly. We have the system time and date. What's important here is we can see that the hard drive is, is reflected in BIOS. This Toshiba, you just see 128 is the important thing there. We can see that there and these keys and these um, this button pad unfortunately doesn't yet work until I load up Linux so I might have to pull out my um, wireless keyboard, a Logitech K400 Plus that I'm using to check BIOS and for installation in order to scroll through the options. That's an important thing to note. When you install Linux on this, you'll want a, um, a separate USB keyboard to do it because you won't get function keys or really a lot of the keys that you need just from the thumb keyboard on the size of the device. Anyway, so you can see system time and uh, date have been set. I think I need to replace the CMOS battery on that on, on, on the device. I haven't done that uh, yet, but it hasn't affected things so far. Uh, you can see two gigabytes RAM reflected. I'll just zoom in a little further there. You can definitely see it's two gig of RAM and 128 gig uh, SSD that are installed. And just to give give a few more details about installation, uh, make sure that that um, if you want to install Linux from Live USB, which I think is the best thing to do from this device, I have this like little four gig uh, four gig USB stick with Anti X twenty three on it. That you change the boot order. You need to change the boot order so it'll boot from a Live USB stick first. So you go to the boot menu. Uh, you go to boot device priority. Press enter and oh, that's interesting. That's that's been changed around. Um, USB HDD and then move that up using. Uh, let's move it F5 or F6. Anyway, I mean that's I don't have a, a USB hard drive plugged in, but you see you can boot up from CD-ROM from hard drive plugged into USB and then just change the boot order. Make sure you, whichever one you want to boot from with a live CD or live USB stick is on the top in the boot priority order. Okay, so I'll go ahead and, and uh, let's see, enter, let's see, save, save that. And let's see if there's anything else interesting here. Um, yeah, nothing, nothing too exciting. Anyway, okay, so I think I can go ahead and exit the BIOS. Yes, save configuration changes. I do think I need to replace the BIOS um, battery. Okay, so you can see that will 
um, automatically boot into Anti-X 23 in a few seconds, and it is now. Anti-X is a um, is a 30, it's a distribution of, of Debian based on Debian Linux that works on both 64-bit and 32-bit x86 systems. This is a 32-bit system. I think the, the um, distribution's i686 or something like that, or i486. And so you need to make sure you use 32-bit anti-X if you want to be able to um, install. But anyway, it's great to have you know modern 32-bit x86 Linux distribution around to stay compatible with devices like this. Okay, so I'll go ahead and log in. I'll just show you a few things here. A lot of features work really well on this. I mean, right out of the box, I did a lot of tweaking on top of that, but I'd say most things were um, compatible. I logged into the Triple Z ICE Window Manager Desktop Manager option for Anti-X. You can use Fluxbox out of the box as well. You can see here on the right that there are that there is. Let's see, uh, 200 something meg of RAM used right now, and six gigs out of 117 gigs disk space. Wire Wi-Fi took a little bit of work. I used Conman and just had to reset the wireless controller a few times, but uh, that's working fine. Uh, so I can do updates. Let's see if I can get this a little higher up and reduce some of that glare. I can adjust backlight fine. Um, I guess just to go through everything, a uh, touch screen did not work out of the box. I had to do some uh, tweaks to get that working. Um, let me zoom out a bit. Yeah, so I had to do some tweaks to get the uh, touch screen working. The keyboard largely works, though I did have to add in additional startup script to get this uh, little D-pad, button pad here working. Let's see, so, so touch screen took some work. Uh, sound worked out of the box. The key, Most of the keyboard worked out of the box. Uh, sound works out of the box. Uh, the webcam, I might have to tweak a good bit. Battery monitoring was pretty good, but I did add in a um, FD power bond just to see see rough battery charge there in the lower right hand corner. Okay, so let me just go to uh, terminal here. I've customized this to use unski font like I do on most of my machines. Let's see if I can zoom in and get you a better view of that. Yes, you can see I, I like to have amber unski font in my terminal, so you just find that a bit easier to read. We can do NeoFetch here, and you can see hardware details. So you can see again 252 megs used, 1024 by 600 display. The display again is working fine out of the box. That's That's been difficult for, for somewhat embedded I think there are these cheap tablets you can get there. They're X64 processors, but but have a 32-bit um, bootloader. Those are a real pain, and it's understandable why those are so cheap. Here, you know, no problem with with the display out of the box, unlike those tablets. Let's see. So some other interesting things to show you. I guess I, one pretty cool thing to show you is is and to demonstrate the touchscreen is. Um, Journal, journal, um, X journal, that is a little note-taking client like those sticky notes I showed you earlier. I'll just pull the stylus out, and my cat will be very interested in this. And you'll see that after a lot of calibration, I was able to get the stylus to work. Hi YouTube. Happy. Scribbling. Scribble. Oh, it's yeah, sorry. <laughs> I do know how to spell. Yeah. So the touch screen works great. I would like to use this for some kind of digital artwork, graphic design kind of purposes. You know, you can have different colors here. You know, you could draw all sorts of things. You know, chemical structures for fun. That would be fun, you know, chem informatics with this. Let's get one that's very visible. Green. 
and yeah, I mean, the touchscreen works great. Uh, that took a lot of work. I had to install a, the um, EG Touch driver. It's an eGalaxy touchscreen. I'll just show you some of the steps there. It's a proprietary driver, but it's very simple to install. You just install this USB touchscreen and blacklist it and caught for in the um, configuration files. Yeah, it's more calibration that's difficult because you have to set up X coordinates and Y coordinates so that the pointer isn't uh, isn't throw way off from where you touch the screen outside of the center. Um, I'll show you what configuration I used for that. Let me save this because it's kind of cute. Okay, there we go. I'll go ahead and close that. Okay, so let's see here. So I have some details on how I set up the uh, touchscreen calibration. Um, okay, so more X input uh, touchscreen calibration. What I eventually did was, was again, setting the scaling XYs to 0 0.08, the offset on the left to negative 0.4. I'll, I'll, I can just you know put this in the description section, but I had to tweak that a lot and then use um, X input calibrator to make sure that I pick the right uh, touchscreen scaling. So so I just show you this because uh, you want to see wherever I put the stylus on the dot that the uh, mouse is you know roughly uh, where where is roughly right on that um, uh, pinpoint again so when I touch the pinpoint the stylus should be right where the mouse shows up and like that was a little off but this was pretty good and what I ended up doing is I kept tweaking the X and Y parameters until I saw that the mouse was where the stylus was touching those four points and that was actually kind of fun, um, in a weird way. Anyway, so that's the touch screen. Um, I'll show you sound in just a second. Let me show you how I got this uh, button pad to work nicely here. Um, I should also increase the screen brightness. Let me try that. X backlight. Uh, backlight 50. Uh, let's see. So set. Yeah, so I want to set the, the backlight to be a little bit brighter. Uh, let's see. Sorry, not two, two dashes, one dash. There we go. So that's probably a bit easier to see. Sorry, I, I didn't have that set to be quite as bright in the beginning. You just want to save battery power. Um, yeah, that should be a lot easier for you to read. Anyway, so where was I going with this? So I showed you the touch screen. Uh, let me show you what I did to get these arrow keys working. Uh, I'll zoom out a bit. And you can see when I press the D-pad, I can go back through my commands. That's not default. These aren't set in the key map. Um, I had to do something kind of complicated with init scripts. Let's see, so more extra keys. Yes, yeah, so hopefully you can see that. Let me zoom in again. Yeah, so so I used uh, set key codes, one for the arrow keys. You know, I found these in a forum post, and then also for the shutter, UDF, and uh, menu keys. Um, sorry, shutter on the side uh, over here, and then UDF and menu keys to be uh, different uh, function mapped to function keys F4, F5, and F11. I'm hoping to get these volume keys to map to you know increasing and lowering the volume. Again, kind of fun. It was a little bit of a pain. I created this script called uh, keyboard, uh, sorry, uh, etc init.d. This is a sysv init system, you know, system 5 init scripts, which, you know, if you manage Linux systems, you'll know those well. Keyboard fix.sh. I'll output that for you all. And anyway, so that shows you what I've added. And I guess the, uh, and I had to use um, 
in serve in order to set this up again for the proper run levels. Don't just try this in one of the different run levels. You need to set it in two, three, four, and five because I kept trying this and trying this and the uh, arrow buttons weren't mapped until I read that I need to you know properly configure init scripts with uh, in serve. Okay, so I just want to very quickly show you that the audio here also works. I'm going to pull up the web browser, which is a little bit slow. I think this is, you know, as weird as it is, it's better to have links on this. While that loads up, I'll mention what I want to do with this. I think this would be a great computer for uh, retro gaming, for some simple graphic design, very simple media. I don't think for a lot of web browsing, just given how heavy the web is now, but um, I think a wider browser than Firefox would be really great. Okay, so hopefully this goes through. Uh, let me pull up um, my radio show and just wrap everything up from there. Oh, there we go. Got the archive. Yeah, you can see this is a bit slow. This is Firefox ESR, which is a wider Firefox, but still uh, kind of slow. Um, I'll just pull up one episode here and we'll hear some uh, Let's get Raquel Zuzaya. Don't need those pictures of me and my cat. Uh, yeah, let's pull up Raquel Zuzaya. Yeah, again, it's a radio show that I still host and broadcast from the Toshiba satellite laptop from 2009. Amazing what you can do with old computers. Um, okay, and we'll hear this. And that will conclude. <laughs> I think you can see the audio works here. Yeah, I think that was Mata Siwaraya from Benny Moray. But anyway, so just the point was to show you that you can listen to audio with this. The audio is working fine on Linux. That's not always the case for some of these more specialized tablets. Anyway, so I think that uh, covers everything. Oh, I guess one other thing to note is this cute little joystick works there. Okay, I just want to show you, you know, some of the uh, configuration I did to show you that I was able to install Linux and uh, the tweaks I did here. Future videos will be on, you know, retro gaming and um, other programs I install in this. Maybe some graphic design, maybe some multimedia. I might get, you know, a blue, there is Bluetooth on this, so maybe a Bluetooth um, gamepad um, or joystick I can, I can use with this. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, if you have more thoughts about upgrades or what you've done with your Samsung Q1 Ultra, leave them in the comments down below. And like and subscribe as always. Thanks for watching.